before we get into the data, I want to uh, open it up to some of our members to come up and say a few words to tee us off as we talk about uh, black and Latino businesses and the use of digital tools. Uh, Representative Evans from Pennsylvania, who's the ranking member on the Economic Growth, Tax and Capital Access and Contracting and Workforce uh, Subcommittees here. Uh, I'm hoping that you can come on, come on up and, and uh, say a couple words. Thank, Thank you. you very much. Thank you, Spence, for that introduction. I really appreciate this opportunity, especially to be among a few of my colleagues who are here. Um, and it's a real honor for the historical perspective that you have meant um, for this entire nation and for this subject. This is a subject that we all are extremely concerned. I come from the district, uh, the second congressional district in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania, a district that has about 27% poverty in that district. About 195,000 people are in poverty in that particular district. And I believe that the number one way to address the question of poverty is wealth building and wealth creation. Uh, I believe that that is the sounding board when we start talking about making a change and moving the needle. So your discussion today, Spence, is very appropriate, particularly with my colleagues here, uh, because that probably is the issue uh, that we fundamentally need to address. Though I am new to Congress, I am not new to public life. Uh, I was in the state legislature for 36 years. Uh, and in that 36 years, the job that I had uh, served was on the Appropriation Committee for 28 or 36 years. And I raised up to be chairman of that particular position. That's the particular position I tell people that Ben Franklin used to hold. Uh, at that time, he called it a Ways and Means Committee and then it changed to the Appropriation Committee. It was the committee that basically you talked about a strategic investment and where you would make the investments in that particular case in the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania. Well, I share with people that though here in Washington, the concept is still the same. The question is how do you have economic growth and create a private sector, particularly in the African American community and the Latino community. How do you grow? How do you make that happen? And how do you exactly have access to capital because the real question is access to capital by business growth and business development and entrepreneurship. And that's something that we all should be starting with in our neighborhoods in elementary school. I'll tell you a little concept. I started an initiative in Pennsylvania about how to address something called food deserts, meaning supermarkets in neighborhoods. Uh, and basically I came up with an initiative that we got $30 million uh, set aside the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania, but it was because of the federal government was able to make that work. Uh, some of my colleagues will remember the new market tax credit that they did at the national level. Well, we piggyback on that, that, that example. We use that leverage. We generated almost 100 supermarkets in the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania. I was able to push that concept and to one of my colleagues from Ohio. Uh, she was able to put in the farm bill, uh, Marsha Fudge, that we build on the idea of food. So I'm on the Small Business Committee, but I'm on the Agriculture Committee. And I tell people that food policy is foreign policy. Food policy is foreign policy. And does anybody here not like food? Because I see y'all uh, eating a lot. I see my guy eating a lot. Let somebody know you don't like food. Food, there's a strategic strategy around economic development relating to food. And I think that there's something that we can build on. Because with the Farm Bill up for reauthorization for its five years, there's, a, there's opportunities in the Farm Bill because farming is small business. And that's something we don't have a tendency to talk about or look at it. There is a school in my district called Saul Agricultural School. It came in existence in 1956. There's about 500 young people in that particular school. And in that school, a lot of the young people are looking at the whole aspect of food service and what is connected to food service. So Spence, one of the things I've always tried to do is be very pragmatic in my approach and how we approach things. We need to have models that we can build on, we show that they can work. I think we had a very crucial point uh, at this point. And you know all the noise being made over there at the White House, so I don't worry about that. I think here in the Congress we got an opportunity to make some of these things happen. Mm -hmm. And I think here, with what you're doing, Smith, 
by laying out the information, we should use that as a building block. So I want to say this in closing, that basically um, the experience that I've used is that there's no more effective group than the Congressional Black Caucus. If you look at the 49 individuals that are members of the Congressional Black Caucus, they have all kinds of various backgrounds, but it's some of the smartest people in the world. And I'm saying that to you because in the short time I've been here, and I will be here one year come November the 14th, one year I will have been in the Congress, and as I've said in the various meetings and listened to all my colleagues, they all are strategic thinkers. They all recognize that we have to move the needle. And move the needle means economic growth. That is the number one issue. If you want to talk about particularly in poor communities, you really want to talk about economic growth. If you want to talk about poverty, you want to talk about economic growth. If you want to talk about people being self-sufficient, one of my heroes was Reverend Leon Selvin. And what Reverend Leon Selvin used to say is you don't buy where you don't work. You don't buy where you don't work. What he said, uh, there's a book he wrote called Build Brother Build in 1968. And Reverend Leon Selvin was the first, one of the first people to build the shopping center. And he used the church as a means. He had this program called 1036. And he used that program to leverage 1036 to leverage to build the shopping there. So he used the equity. He used the equity that was in the church, meaning the members. And then using the equity, he leveraged that to buy a shopping center. Because he knew his parishioners needed jobs. And because my good colleague, Representative Meek, knows that at the end of the day, you can't give if you don't have. You can't give if you don't have. And I'm going to steal a line that Representative Meek says you, you, you buy the house and you rent the car. You know what I'm talking about. You buy the house and you rent the car. So that's why I'm saying right now, I believe what you're doing here, Spencer, is that you're poised first with this information. And I applaud you for you providing information. And once you provide the information, then it's being strategic in how you use your leverage to make these things happen. So I'm more than happy on the Small Business Committee and the Agriculture Committee to be a part of this discussion in any way I can be helpful. And I congratulate you. Thank you very much. So we have a few other members uh, who are here, and I'm going to ask them to come up in a moment. I'm going to let you all finish your, your lunch, uh, and I will go over to Congresswoman Lisa Blunt Rochester. She might come up for uh, a couple of moments. You know, she is on the uh, Education and Workforce uh, Committee, and we were pleased to participate on her uh, uh, forum uh, at the uh, ALC this year, and is a real leader in terms of the future work. Thank you so much. Good afternoon, everyone. Good afternoon. Okay, I wasn't expecting to be up here, so I need to feel some love. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Uh, I actually just wanted to step up and again also congratulate the Joint Center and Spencer for the work that you're doing. Um, as he mentioned, uh, I was fortunate to have him serve on a panel at our ALC at the CBC conference and what was really special was that it was at a time of day, it was almost conflicting with the prayer breakfast, it was a Saturday morning. We didn't have P. Diddy on the panel, and, I, and it was all about automation and technology and the changing landscape and how that disruption was going to affect communities of color, really about the future of work. And so that night I had told the group I had a nightmare that only five people would show up for this you know, think tank, Aspen Institute, Joint Center, no P. Diddy, and we actually had standing room only which was phenomenal and it was all ages all demographics and at that uh, event Spencer presented some hot off the press new data about the jobs that will be impacted by these changes and these changes are not coming they're here we don't have bank tellers like we used to we don't pump our own gas unless you live in New Jersey you know I mean there are certain things that have changed and so communities of color are impacted particularly on autonomous vehicles we had uh, Maya um, Rockymore up on the panel as well talking about buses and trucks 
These are jobs that people depended on that made good living, ne not necessarily needed a college degree to do them, and these things are being impacted. And so part of the discussion was not how do we, the sky is falling and fear it, but how do we leverage it? How do we take advantage of these changes and make sure that we are prepared for the changes? And so I just wanted to stand up here and, and let you know I serve on the Education and Workforce Committee and on that the Health, Employment, Labor and Pension Subcommittee, which is important because I come from a labor background as Secretary of Labor in the state of Delaware, former Secretary, and then also on the Higher Ed and Workforce Development Subcommittee where we're talking about a lot of these issues and career training and how do we prepare the workforce now and into the future. And then I'm also with Dwight on the Agriculture Committee. And what I love about the Ag Committee is that I always say it's urban, it's rural, and it's global. It's nutrition programs, it's SNAP, it is also biotech and research, which is important to my state, the state of Delaware. It's our land-grant institutions, like our HBCUs, but it's also global food security around the world. So for me, uh, I'm also a, a new member and very honored to get to serve with Eddie Bernice Johnson and Gregory Meeks. And is, I saw Nydia come on, did I say yes, yes. I get to serve with some incredible people. And my only other message to you is that, um, as Dwight said, there's a lot swirling around. But when you look at these folks, and I see it day by day, you can be very hopeful. You can know that we are very focused on what is important. And so with the work of the Joint Center, we're able to achieve those things. So thank you for the opportunity to say a few words, um, and let's get to the work. Yeah, right, right, right. Thank you. So we're focused today on black and Latino businesses, but you all know that in terms of workforce, Black and Latino businesses are significant contributors in terms of likelihood to hire Black and Latino folks. So we certainly appreciate Representative uh, Lisa Blunt Rochester for stopping by. Um, so future economy, Representative Nidia Velazquez, she's from the 7th District, Congressional District of New York. Uh, for our purposes, she's incredibly important because she's the ranking member of the Small Business Committee, the House Committee on Small Business. And as you know, we're talking about tech tools, digital tool use by uh, Latino and black businesses. And we'd appreciate it uh, if you'd come forth and, and, and give us a few words. Thank you so much for being here. Thank you. Thank you, and uh, good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to the Capitol. I, I hear that there is an event at the White House with uh, Mr. Trump, um, you know, celebrating entrepreneurship and small businesses. Um, one of the best things that we can help as uh, minority businesses is by strengthening the budget of the Small Business Administration so that we could provide the kind of services that will enable uh, small businesses to learn of the kind of tools that we have within the federal government uh, to help create, uh, uh, to help business formation in our communities. Business formation has been so, uh, has decreased dramatically. And I always say, access to capital is access to opportunity. And we have some small business lending programs within the Small Business Administration. What we need is the type of manpower and uh, educational uh, programs uh, that will provide the type of information that is needed so that you know what to do and where to go in order for you to start up a business or take your business to the next level. One of them is federal procurement. We are, we are the largest um, um, buyer in, around the world, $500 billion in procurement uh, uh, money. $500 billion, that is safe money. If you, as a small business, I know for sure that whatever you, whatever product or services that you sell, the government, the federal government buys. But let's talk about um, some other issue regarding technology. So thank you all for being here. One of the things that I care more about is supporting our entrepreneurs. Entrepreneurship is uniquely part of the American culture and sets our economy apart.
from the rest of the world. The American spirit drives our business owners to turn their dreams into reality. And when they do, the U.S. economy as a whole benefits. Running a business in the age of technology is the only way to stay competitive. Access to the most innovative technology is the key to success in this day and age. It opens the gates to the digital economy and worldwide commerce. The accelerated pace in technological development is also shifting the employment landscape worldwide with about 19 million people working as software developers and 8.7 million developing mobile op apps. Regardless of the type of business, the most successful firms are the ones adopting new technology to become more effective and efficient at meeting customer needs. However, many small firms find it difficult to keep pace with the changes and how to fund them. Much of the new technology can be expensive and require more thorough data protection me measures, thereby adding to the cost. Many of the new technology, like cloud-based products, mobile websites, and new apps, require a good internet connection. That is why I would like to highlight the importance of broad broadband access to ensure underserved communities stay competitive. While technological advancement make it easier for small businesses to operate in today's economy, there is a comparative disadvantage for businesses that do not have streamlined broadband access. Earlier this summer, the committee, my committee, held a hearing to hear potential policy changes that Congress could make to improve broadband access for the nation's small businesses. All witnesses pointed to the same conclusion, ensuring universal broadband access. We have also heard that small firms need access to capital to help them purchase broadband, invest in new technology, and build cybersecurity platforms to protect themselves, their employees, and their customers. I think these points ring true, and I have been and will continue to advocate for this priority. I supported more access to lending to help grow our innovative tech companies and the small businesses utilizing that technology. We also worked with the majority staff to pass a bill requiring small business development centers to work with the Department of Homeland Security to develop a small business cyber strategy. Silicon Valley must serve as a role model in promoting the use of technology in small firms across the nation. We must hold U.S. tech firms accountable, especially given the role in the broader, broader economy. The tech sector employs 7 million people in the U.S. and accounts for more than $1.3 trillion in economic activity in the nation's economy. While they serve as role models in adopting technology, they are failing in one very important aspect. It is in recruitment where our top tech performers are falling behind. In 2016, reports show that only 3% of Facebook engineers were black. At Twitter, the same percentage is true of their entire payroll. Hispanics are also underrepresented in the tech industry comprising 8% of total employees and 3% of executives. It is my hope that the tech sector will embrace the leadership and talent offered by minority innovators and executives, a step many small firms have already accomplished. At the end of September, we met with some prominent tech firms to stress the importance of building an, inclus an inclusive workforce. Workplace. As ranking member of the Small Business Committee, I want to hear more of how the government can partner with the private sector and organizations to support innovation and economic growth among businesses of color. So I want to thank you and for your report that you're putting forward today or that you are releasing. But it is that kind of advocacy that will help us uh, shape public policy that will not only help minority businesses, 
but also help our U.S. economy. And there is no, um, the reality is that Silicon Valley and all these tech companies must play a role into not only embracing diversity, but promoting the kind of public education that will enable low-income students and minority students to benefit and, and to be part of this innovative economy. So thank you for having me. Thank you so much. Thank you. Um, I'd now like to call uh, Representative Eddie Bernice Johnson, who is actually the ranking member of the Science, Space, and Technology Committee, and, and they really are on top of these issues in terms of the future and uh, the impact of the future and, and technology on communities of color. Uh, Representative, thank you so much for being here. Well, thank you. We have folks that we can call, so I'll be brief so that my colleague will have a few minutes to say a few words. Um, Congressman uh, Meeks from New York is here as well. This is really a very timely topic because what happens, what has been the pattern? As employment patterns have changed, more minorities have gone into their own entrepreneurship and open individual businesses, and more women have done that uh, more, more than, than ever before in history. In the uh, Science, Space, and Technology Committee, we get a chance to look at the innovations that are on the horizons and see some of the trends that are taking place. I'm from Dallas, Texas, and in the Dallas area, we have the largest number of corporate headquarters in the nation and perhaps the smallest unemployment uh, in the nation, and the environment is high tech. And what we're experiencing, I just thought about it, listening to my colleague, I'll be right there. Oh, so. uh, we're experiencing a lot of expansion in new areas that was farmland. And we have a, a, a large um, rapid rail system going, it's about maybe 25 years old, but when it was planned, that area was not involved in the planning. Now we have 15 or 20 brand new small food, uh, uh, what do you call, fast food restaurants that have opened that cannot find people to work there. The average access is about $10 an hour. But people that live in the area have very expensive homes even the apartments. And the ones who they need to work there live on the other end of the county and cannot afford to live up there and really cannot afford to get there. So in driving in the area, it's one of the few areas that are starting to look for substitutes for human beings. Uh, we've opened a hotel that has robots doing room service. Uh, we are also looking at the driverless vehicle. I'm working on legislation, as a matter of fact, now to get curriculum uh, into our colleges or junior colleges uh, to make sure that young people uh, or, or people uh, learn to drive vehicles by computer rather than behind the wheel because we have such a large trade area. We have perhaps the largest truck driving population in the nation uh, in Texas. We are in a changing times, and workforces will be differently played out. And so I hope as young people you will realize that we're, we're really at a crossroads in terms of future forward in jobs uh, because of automation. Uh, I went with President uh, Obama a year before last now to Germany for the uh, C7, and we had a chance to visit the BMW plant where BMWs and Rolls Royce are made. And the plant was as big as this hill. And we walked from about 10 in the morning to 2 in the afternoon to see the whole operation. And in seeing that massive operation from the beginning to the end of the finish in these vehicles, we saw maybe 10 human beings. 
robots was doing all of the work. So when we talk about moving jobs overseas, don't believe it. We're doing away with them uh, through automation, but they're not moving anywhere because we built all this automation uh, here in this country and we're selling it overseas and now we're going to start seeing more of it here. About two years ago, American Airlines kind of overnight switched to uh, self-boarding and self-checking of your luggage. And also about 3,000 people were without jobs who were doing your boarding passes and checking your bags. That will continue. And, and we need, as young people and small businesses, to be more prepared for that coming trend than anyone else, because this is really going to impact the future. Not to be afraid of it, but to make, be aware of it and see, as a matter of fact, uh, next week or the week after, uh, we're having here a Future Forward Workforce uh, Dialogue, where we're bringing in people <clears throat> really from around the nation to talk about what we're looking forward to. You know, when you walk out on the street now, you can do that in Washington and punch in the kind of sandwich or whatever you want and drop your money and it pops out. Uh, that used to be handled by two or three human beings. And so uh, I'm too old to worry about too much of a change. But you people, the audience here, you will be a part of that change. And it's important. I told my grandson, my youngest grandson is a senior in college, and he's eight years behind the next grandson. And I said to him, when you finish, if you haven't taken computer science, just continue. Uh, because it appears to me that the real skill without a college degree is going to be in computer science. And if you have a small business or you're opening one, you will also need to know how to operate these gadgets that you're going to be getting involved in producing the product that you're trying to produce. So thank you very much for being here. Congresswoman, woman, thank you so much for your leadership in terms of also future work. You all know that this morning we had an event with the National Urban League. We released data that showed that 31% of Latinos and 27% of African Americans are concentrated in just 30 occupations that are at high risk to automation. So things like drivers, cashiers, that kind of thing. So we appreciate her leadership here. Congressman Gregory Meeks uh, here. Thank you so much for being here. He's a senior member of the Financial Services Committee. Economic development has really been a cornerstone issue. Uh, hope that you can uh, come on up and, and say a few words. Thank you also for your leadership of the CBC PAC. Thank you, Spence. And uh, God, I just want the first thing about Eddie Bernice Johnson was just awesome because she's really talking about the future. And that's what this is really about. Now for me, you are the key to that future. Now I talked about the past, and the past for me when I ran for election back 20 years ago actually is, you know, some folks talked about, and we've been talking about the civil rights movement. And I say that the second phase of the civil rights movement is economics. It's about money. It's about creating stability in the communities of which we live in. And it's not being just completely dependent upon whether or not there is a federal grant or not, where we do need it, but we need to make sure that it is utilized as, as a fertilizer so that we can grow the businesses that will be the stabilizers of our community that then give you the economic wherewithal to create jobs that will stabilize the community and think forward on how to make it happen. So those of you, and there's different messages for different people. Those of you that are in this room are the thinkers for tomorrow. So we've got to make sure that, yes, the problem in America, and when you go over to a Rust Belt or some urban areas, et cetera, with those individuals who have to depend upon manual labor to get things done, we've got to worry about them. And we've got to make sure we're creating opportunities for them. But my message to those of you in this room, you know, I believe to whom much has been, who's much given, much is required. So much is required of you to come up with those dynamite ideas 
that's going to create the economy of tomorrow to make this place a better place. And that's why the research and the work that you've done, Spencer, is so important because you all need to take that information and, di and, 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 and digest it so that you can make the creations that you're able to move forward with, creating the economic opportunities that make it for a better life. I mean, what Eddie Bernice was talking about, I mean, you go back a few years ago, and the people that were frowning was the candle makers when Con Edison invented the electric light bulb. <laughs> you know, there used to be, uh, so the progress you cannot stop. Its ideas are unlimited. And what I think that we need to do in government, for example, on financial services, is that we've got to think out of the box and not think about how we did things 30 and 40 years ago. Because it doesn't work today. You know that. And I'm sure you get tired of people like me, like me saying we've got to do something like we did 30 or 40 years ago. We're not going to manufacture the way we did 30 or 40 years ago. We're not even going to do finance the way we did 30 or 40 years ago. We bank differently than we did 30 or 40 years ago. So what's going to be and how do we get access to capital? How do we make financial institutions more available to us? We've got to revamp CRA to give incentives to make sure that we're learning, uh, lending money to people again. We can't go by where CRA was done before. We've got to think of how we need to do it now and in the future so that we can have the, op the capital that's necessary. We need to be proactive because guess what? Most of the way you're going to do your businesses, where most of the people are, they're not in the United States of America. They're all over the world. And so therefore we can't limit ourselves to just one small area. We've got to look at, and that's why we not, sometimes we get folks, they're afraid of talking about trade or this or that. No, well if you keep yourself in a box, the rest of the world is going to be moving around and we will be left out. Now the exciting thing about being in this time is that you have a choice. We have a choice. We could be on the engine that drives it or the caboose that just follows. And I say that we want to do, we want to be in the engine. You can drive it, you can shape it, you can make it. Don't wait because sometimes we wait and say, oh, I wish if I only had done this or done that, the opportunity is right now right now and the information that you're going to get from Spencer and the Joint Center is what gives you the tools to make sure that happens. So with all the crises that's going on in this country, with everything that you know people are talking about, I don't say woe is me. I say there's opportunity there. There's opportunity to change things and make it even better. It's just that you've got to take advantage of that opportunity and I feel confident when I look at information that Spencer's given out and I look at audiences and talk to audiences like you, there's never been a time in history when as many people has been as bright and as ready as you are. Never ever in history. So I look at the future as being real bright. I look at the future as being greater than it's ever been before because you are more prepared than any generation ever before to do it. And with the tools, that's all we got to do is to give it to you, and you will enhance that, then tomorrow is going to be much better than today or yesterday. So thank you, and look forward to working with you. Thank you so much again, Congressman Mix. Appreciate that, um, those words. Uh, and just another, I already acknowledged them, but just another uh, acknowledgement and round of applause for uh, our authors here in terms of Ron Burby Jr. Uh, here, Mia Woodard, and Morgan Burton. So now I'm going to introduce a friend. Right? She's been in the trenches with us. She's been the vice president of policy at the National Urban League. She was the chief of staff to FCC Commissioner Mignon Clyburn. You know, Mignon is really the, the voice of equity and inclusion in terms of the FCC and really the federal government. Right? And now we're fortunate to have Chanel at Google. So I'm, 
Uh, Chanel Hardy, why don't you come on up and say a few uh, words here. We appreciate you being here. She's also my boss. She's also a board member here. So I got to, you know, uh, uh, get, her, get her insights and, and follow her lead here. Thank you, Spencer. And I really will have just a few words. Um, but it's good to see all of you today, especially a lot of friends in the room. Um, and uh, what I am excited about today is, one, um, I, I always love to see um, a data gap being solved. That's something I felt uh, before I got to Google. I certainly feel it even more. Um, we all love the SBAs, a small business report that comes out every five years. It is outstanding information. That's a little bit of a gap in between. Um, and so what's exciting is soon you'll hear um, kind of a critical first step in us um, uh, with the leadership of the Joint Center, the partnership of the U.S. Hispanic and Black Chambers that are in the room today, um, really starting to uh, identify that additional information um, and leverage it, as Congressman Meeks just said so eloquently, um, to solve some of the challenges that we're all excited about solving. So I just wanted to um, just add my thanks to all of the partners in the room. Uh, Ron, obviously, Jr. was um, not only a, a fellow at the Joint Center, but at Google, um, and uh, great friends uh, like Ron Leslie. Uh, we go back many, many years. So uh, thank you all for your contribution. Um, just a couple of things I wanted to note, because um, even if I hadn't thought of flagging this, uh, based on some of the things the members said, I wanted to, I would be remiss if I did not note that uh, Google is trying to step up and recognize that there is an opportunity gap associated with a lot of the changing nature of work in this country um, and trying to play uh, at least a small part in that. Um, you might have heard just two weeks ago our CEO announced um, our commitment um, to growing with Google around uh, local communities. And so if you have not been to grow.google yet, please go, please sign up for updates. We're probably coming to a city that you care about um, or a town that you care about. And there's a lot of tools that we hope will be super helpful. Uh, we also announced a billion dollars in funding commitments from our foundation um, to address this opportunity gap, as well as one million volunteer hours um, from Googlers. Um, and then finally, um, if you have not seen our annual economic report, which really speaks to the ways that um, you know our business is e-commerce. So when small businesses and medium-sized businesses, businesses owned by people of color are successful, um, we're successful. And so you can kind of track some of our favorite stories and some of the numbers around this impact at google.com slash economic impact. Um, so thanks again for all of you being here, um, and I look forward to the presentation. Thanks again, Chanel. And it's just, you know, just really great to have folks who have our values in important places like Google. So thank you so much for being here. So I want to present, kind of lay out the data uh, compiled by Ron, Nina, and Morgan. And again, just to state, this would not have been possible without the U.S. Black Chambers and without the U.S. Hispanic Chamber of Congress. I mean, we literally, they sent the poll out to their members. If their members hadn't responded and if they hadn't participated, this information, we just wouldn't have it, right? So they're really critical partners in terms of, of, of this. Right? Um, so you remember when having a website was enough to be kind of special and different, right? And of course, those, those days are, are gone, you know? The question is, where are our businesses in this digital uh, world? We've become increasingly reliant on our devices, whether it's to find the nearest gas station or to pay for coffee with a, a swipe of our phones. And businesses of color really have to do this internal check and ask themselves, are they as easy to find as other businesses? Are they using tools to be uh, efficient uh, here and to uh, build their capacity? Are they using innovations like data analytics and to analyze data and understand what decisions they need to make? Or, or mobile apps to increase their, their brand awareness right here. So right now the Joint Center is focused on the future of communities of color. And where are we in terms of this new economy? We're asking how do things like 
automation, artificial intelligence impact our communities? Uh, how do we prepare our communities? How do we mitigate issues like job loss, but how do we take advantage of opportunities, like new job opportunities, right? Like the reduced costs of, let's say, transportation and get some of our folks to work, uh, and like um, new tools that make businesses more efficient that are affordable uh, here, right? Now, we said, some of you may have been on the Senate side, we released some data this morning that I referenced, uh, and we focused on the future of work, but just as important as the future of work, the future of businesses, uh, businesses of uh, color uh, here, right? So these businesses, they're really the economic bedrock of our community. So now, later on this year, not much time left in the year, but later on, within the next month or two, we're going to release a report on black and Latino businesses and the digital economy. So this is going to be an extensive overview of black and Latino businesses, the landscape of available digital tools, and some recommendations about how black and Latino businesses can capitalize on technological advancements uh, to stay competitive, but also to grow, grow revenues, grow capacity, that kind of thing, right? So this technology is new to everyone, and as a result, you know, we could create a more equitable playing field for uh, businesses of color. Before we got to that big report, though, we needed to understand the facts. Right? We, we need to understand the facts about how our black and Latino businesses currently using digital technology. So we partnered with the U.S. Black Chambers and the U.S. Hispanic Chamber of Commerce, as I mentioned, to, to survey their members. So now you all have copies of this data brief, but I'm just going to go through the top lines here. So businesses are online. 90% of black businesses, 95% of the Latino businesses that we surveyed stated that they have websites, uh, over a quarter of the Latino businesses uh, have a Spanish language version of their websites. Uh, a majority of black and Latino businesses also engage social media platforms. Facebook, Twitter, and LinkedIn are the most common choice. Now, the percentages begin to decrease when we talk about websites designed to be viewable across mobile platforms, right? Only 73% and 78% of Latino businesses, uh, their websites are mobile uh, friendly. Thank you, right? uh, the number also decreases when we talk about tracking customer interactions. 51% uh, of black businesses and, um, uh, uh, I'm sorry, 51% of Latino businesses and 44% of black survey respondents said that they track their online customer interaction. Okay. Uh, now, let's talk a little bit about digital marketplace presence. Uh, about 20% of black and Latino businesses surveyed say they have online sales or transactions that account for over 50% of their revenues. Right? But less than half of black businesses and approximately half of Latino businesses report tracking their online ratings. Uh, about a third of black and Latino businesses uh, do not accept online payments. Uh, about three quarters of black and Latino businesses bank online, uh, but less than half of black and Latino businesses reported using digital tools for invoicing, payment processing, or data analytics. Again, again, we're there, we're headed in the right direction, but you know, there's still some room for growth. Uh, with regard to apps, apps that are created, 17% of black businesses 25% of Latino businesses surveyed that they have their own apps. They indicated they have their own apps. Now, to give you some perspective, there was a, a survey, a clutch survey, that basically, and this was not focused on race, that suggested that 42% of small businesses uh, had built apps 
and that number was expected to increase to 67 percent by uh, the end of 2017. Uh, so we, we do need to recognize that apps don't make sense for every business and every industry, right? But there is still some room for uh, growth uh, here, right? Uh, a quarter of our respondents indicated that they were unfamiliar with the process of developing an app, and about a quarter suggested that they lacked the technical support to develop an app. Uh, of the businesses that do have an app, uh, Android is the dominant platform. So now these insights are going to be helpful to us as we explore uh, partnerships with U.S. Black Chambers, U.S. Hispanic Chamber of, of Commerce, and how uh, the, the role that apps play in terms of moving businesses forward. Uh, and, and really that's kind of the whole point. These insights, the data gives us some insight about what we need to do to move forward and, and frankly, not just to keep up, right? I mean, it's great to keep up and keep pace, right? But how do we uh, leapfrog ahead, right? How do we use these tools to affirmatively uh, move ahead? So with that, I'm going to really hand the discussion over to our esteemed Chambers representatives. Uh, and I'm going to ask them to come on up and uh, give us their, their wisdom, their insight here. Uh, and we've got Ron Busby, who's the, Ron Busby Sr., I guess I need to distinguish in this room. We've got Ron Busby Sr., who's the President and CEO of the U.S. Black Chambers. Uh, we've got Sebastian Antiveros, who's the Vice President of Corporate Affairs for the U.S. Hispanic uh, Chamber of, Congress, uh, of Commerce. And we've got Tade Alberto, who's the founder of the Hispanic Chamber of e-commerce, and is going to have some special insights. I'm hoping you all will come on up uh, and, and keep us, us moving. We want to hear from you all about legislative, policy, and program considerations that might align with our work uh, and uh, that, that you think would be helpful to your members. And so basically, we'll hear from these three. Uh, and then we'll open it up in terms of discussion and questions. Yes, yeah, I'm going to I'm going to give it to, to you all. This keeps happening, bro. <laughs> <laughs> well, good afternoon, everyone. Um, first off, I want to say I'm senior. Uh, that's my son over there, Ronald Busby Jr., uh, who did a lot of the work on this project, and I want to give him accolades. Yep. Um, <laughs> It was um, it was really a pleasure doing this, and the reason I say that is because as chamber leaders, we get an opportunity to stand in front of microphones all the time and give speeches. And usually, our speeches are based on old information. We're talking about data that, in many cases, is five years old, and we give assumptions. We say percentages, and we talk about things that, in many cases. We assume the facts, but we don't really know the data. And I'm a believer many times that I always say, well, I already know the issues, so I can speak to those issues. I know that African Americans don't have the credit worthiness to be able to grow their businesses. I know that when I go to talk to my corporate partners, they say, well, yes, I'd love to do more business with African American businesses, but two things, we can't find them, and they don't have the size and the scale. I know when I go talk to my business owners, they talk about issues in their communities, and I give them generic answers. But what this survey did was give us specific data that now I can go talk to my corporate partners, I can talk to my congressional leaders, I can talk to my chamber leaders, and most importantly, I can talk to my business owners across the country about information that is pertinent to each of those issues. And so with it, I want to start off by thanking the Joint Center for bringing us together to be able to participate in this opportunity in this survey. I want to thank the congressional leaders that were here earlier today who supported this initiative because without their voices, even with the data, it falls on deaf ears. And so to have the partnership with the congressional leaders that were here this morning is extremely important. I'll talk a few minutes, if I can, about the U.S. Black Chambers and who we are. Um, ironically enough, Spencer and I started about the same time in our current positions. I began with U.S. Black Chambers in 2009 with six chambers. 
Today we have 129 chambers, we're in 30 states, and we have a membership base of over 265,000 African American owned businesses. We were founded on five key pillars, and many of you have heard them in the past, the first one being advocacy, and having opportunities like this to be able to get in front of you and talk about policy concerns is what we were created for. Our second one, which is important to us, is access to capital. Because as you talk to any small business owner, they will say their number one concern will be getting affordable, accessible credit to be able to grow, expand their businesses. Third is really contract opportunities, and we look at that from three different vantage points. What is government doing with their spending? What is corporate America doing with theirs? And most importantly, what are African Americans doing with their dollars in our own communities? Fourth is about entrepreneurial training, and that's why I think this study is so important because now we can go back and talk to business owners about things that they can do to grow their businesses, to have sustainability in their communities across the country. And this really did deal with some of the myths that we've had. We've heard in our communities over the years that African Americans don't do business online. Myth. We've heard that African Americans don't really have access to capital in their communities. We found that through this survey some of that is a myth as well. There were some things that we also found that we didn't know and we were excited about. African Americans, even though the percentage is small, 5%, but we also have bilingual websites, which means that we're thinking about the future because we understand that more than 90% of our business opportunity is going to come with outside, outside of the boundaries of the United States and many of those customers don't speak English. And so with our partnership with the U.S. Hispanic Chamber, we're going to do even more of that. We also heard, and the myth goes, that African Americans aren't concerned about cybersecurity. And we found that to also be a myth. You see, surveys like this give us the opportunity to deal with the myths, but more importantly, deal with facts. The U.S. Black Chamber has said that we're not only going to spearhead this, but we're going to continue to do more surveys in the future because we understand as we <laughs> determine the facts, we can also deal with the myths and we can grow our communities through sustainability. And so you'll see the U.S. Black Chamber in the future doing more surveys like this to go deeper, to find out real information that's pertinent to our communities, our corporate partners, as well as our government agencies and leaders. And so we're excited about continuing to partner with the Joint Center, to continue to partner with folk and corporations like Google who understand the importance of having good information because every five years is just no longer sufficient in order for us to move our communities. And so with that, I'd like to say thank you to both the Joint Center, to Google, to, in, to the individuals that were participating and uh, did the work on this survey, as well as the U.S. Black Chamber and the U.S. Hispanic Chamber. So thank you very much. We're down to the end, I promise. We're, we're going to get this discussion going right quick. Um, I will just give some very, very, very brief remarks so that we can get into the discussion. Uh, thank you, everyone, for being here. Thank you, Spencer. Thank you uh, to some of the corporate partners that I see in the room here, JP Morgan Chase, uh, Verizon, a lot of our different partners that make kind of things like this and these types of collaborations possible. Um, my name is Sebastian Ontiveros. I'm with the United States Hispanic Chamber of Commerce. I serve as the Vice President of Corporate Affairs, uh, and what a little bit about our organization, we represent over 4.4 million Hispanic-owned businesses throughout the United States and Puerto Rico. Uh, and collectively, those businesses contribute approximately $700 billion to the U.S. economy. And so we work with our 200 local chambers of commerce and over 260 partners to make sure that we you know, collaborate and have that type of impact necessary to kind of support that system. Uh, I'm joined here today by Tade, one of our local chambers of commerce out there in uh, San Diego. So it's an honor to, to be sitting with him here today along with Ron Busby, who's one of our sister uh, chambers of commerce that we work with, along with the uh, U.S. Pan-Asian American Chamber of Commerce and the National Gay and Lesbian Chambers of Commerce to, you know, again, make opportunities like this possible. So really quick, again, I just wanted to kind of highlight some of the things that I noticed in uh, in this study that I think are pertinent to this discussion, and I think Ron also talked a little bit about them. You know, when you're looking at these demographics and our shared communities, uh, you know, we're the, we're the youngest population inside the country, and with that, we have 
six times, when, when compared to the national average, we have six times uh, the number of new ventures opening up uh, at a rate of six to one when compared to the general market. And with inside of that, there are three times as many Latina businesses that are opening business venture, new business ventures uh, when compared to their male counterparts. So kind of breaking that down and looking at it as a whole, you know, those things also equate to being, again, a, an over-index of being a, a younger population, having an over-index in mobile, uh, mobile usage, having an over-index in, in internet usage. And I think that what this report does is it identifies some of these areas of opportunity. I think some of the, one of the underlying themes that we've heard here today is that this is an American issue. This is not a, a black or Latino issue. This is when American businesses succeed, the U.S. economy succeeds. When black and Latino businesses su succeed, the U.S. economy succeeds. So I think that that's something that's been kind of an underlying theme throughout this process. And I can't believe we're here because I remember <laughs> it seems like forever ago, but I think that was only maybe a year ago that we sat down to first kind of talk about this. Uh, so again, I think that this what this report does is it identifies areas of growth and areas of opportunity that we have to build upon, uh, that we have to uh, uh, collaborate together. Because this is really, you know, I think one of the, the, uh, the analogies that I hear about us all be kind of being kind of in the same boat uh, together is kind of, it, it gets exhausted a little bit. But what I felt like what this report has done, especially in collaboration with the U.S. Black Chamber and some of our local chambers of commerce is, you know, it's identified the fact that we maybe, maybe we, we said that we were in the same boat, but maybe there was a boat over here, or a boat over there, and we we're all kind of keeping track of each other's boats, but now this really kind of brings us together and shows us the areas of growth and the areas of opportunity that we have to collaborate together to help uh, uh, our small businesses and, and, and meeting some of the challenges that affect us disproportionately, such as, as Ron uh, mentioned, the uh, cybersecurity issue. You know, often we're the first affected by by uh, things of this nature and the last to know or the last to be educated. So digital lit literacy and preparedness is a huge uh, uh, kind of takeaway that I've had from this report and you know, look forward to uh, continuing to work together and figuring out how we can connect the dots with also our local chambers of commerce to help uh, 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 come up with solutions that are identified through this, uh, through this report. So thank you very much. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is uh, Taide Aburto. I'm a Mexican immigrant. I moved to San Diego in 2006. And in 2008, I came out with this crazy idea of starting the Hispanic Chamber of E-Commerce. Um, I can tell you how excited I am to be here today because this is something that I've been working you know, over the last nine years. And from my perspective, you know, what reality in San Diego County is like the majority of the 43,000 Hispanic-owned businesses in the area, they are family-owned businesses with less than five employees making less than $150,000 in annual uh, revenue. So that's the reality of the community where I come from. So one way to empower these family-owned businesses is through the use of the internet and technology to help them to become more competitive in the marketplace. So I think this report, it's gonna give us a lot of uh, insights that are gonna help us to keep moving the agenda forward. Um, the reality right now is that we have 290 million uh, internet users in the US, 214 are using Facebook, and uh, small businesses could leverage all this information to start marketing their products and services online. The other reality is that in, in a lot of our communities, the average household income is very low. So we can expect family-owned businesses to increase that annual sale if, they're, if they don't start thinking outside their communities to pitch their products and services. Um, and one way to do it is by utilizing the internet as a business tool. That's one way to help them to become more competitive. Where I come from, a lot of the uh, business goes to Mexico. So we need to start helping family-owned businesses to start thinking globally, not just from the perspective of using the internet as a tool, but also you know, from the import-export uh, part of the equation because business is outside the communities and that's how we can bring more dollars to where we live and boost the economy thanks to all these tools that we have access to. So that's very briefly what I've been working on and I really look forward to working with the Joy Center, Spencer, 
and Mia, thank you very much for inviting me today, and look forward to uh, helping in any way I can. Thank you. Okay, I think at, at this period, we're really going to open it up uh, to give people who are here an opportunity to either offer comments or ask questions in terms of our panelists. Uh, and so I just, I just really open, open up the floor uh, in terms of, of, of thoughts for the folks who are here. Uh, Ted Archer from J.P. Morgan Chase. Uh, I want to thank the panelists for your insights uh, and, and also the Joint Center for, uh, for moving this initiative forward. Um, oftentimes when we think about small business, we think about them as a homogenous group. Um, Heidi, I'd like that you sort of categorize uh, the group that you serve under 150,000 a year, under five employees. And so I was wondering if there was a, an ability to categorize the businesses within the study to draw more insights as to what might be needed for larger businesses versus small, certain industry types and, and geography. Okay, and let me do this. Ron, is that something I know that you study? I don't, I don't know that you have talkers on it right here in terms of, right? The person who's probably most familiar with that particular data who's actually looked at it is uh, Ron Jr. And again, I, I know you, you don't have talkers on that. Any insights you want to provide with regard to that? Could you restate the question one more time for me? Absolutely. Well, thank you first um, for your work on this. Um, so I was wondering if the data that, that you were able to glean um, had the ability to be categorized in such a way that we could tell large businesses versus small, if you could cut it by geography or even cut it by industry, so that more insights could be drawn from uh, some of the specific needs that smaller businesses have versus larger businesses. Yeah, no, so we, when we did this, there's the awesome thing about it is we asked things like where, where you are, your zip code, we asked what kind of business you were in. So we have the capacity to understand at a more narrow uh, level what those businesses are and whatnot. But I think what we were trying to do is really give a landscape of what it means to be black in a, or, or Hispanic or Latino in a 21st century economy. And so I think there are obviously other opportunities to get really detailed into the specific elements of those, those communities. But we, we looked at their education levels and how that cross-references with their, their the, the kind of revenue stream they might have. We looked at their gender. So we, we have all of those, those data points. It's just a matter of what question we want to ask and what answer we're looking to get. Um, and so I think that there's a capacity to do that for sure. And, and we had, what were the revenue tiers we had just generally about? I mean, I believe it was like a, a million plus between 500,000 and 999,000. And then it sort of goes tier down based on more narrow things under $25,000. And a majority of the businesses uh, sort of operate in that under 25,000 or between that and $75,000. And so we see it, you know, a lot of these are mostly, you know, self-run businesses with one person so you know they are they are sort of their own they're their CEO their CTO their CFO they operate in the holistic element of what it means to run the business and so um, yeah there definitely is some things that they can for themselves learn yeah why don't you guys go ahead and then I'll yeah. touch on that. there was there was a question there that really intrigued me um, many times entrepreneurs say man you don't got to go to college to become an entrepreneur learn your business you know get some business skills and work hard and and it's hard to, to to combat that conversation without some data so one of the questions that was in there it says if you were a million dollars and above what is your education level and it was ironic that the firms that were over a million dollars 78 percent of them had a master's degree that's a different conversation that we've been able to have historically about the importance of education. There were questions that were there that you may not necessarily find in the survey that Spencer has that I don't know if they're prepared to share, but that's the reason why we're going to do a deeper dive because there's information in reference to the number of size of business. We all know that the average black owned business is less than $75,000. That's great. But when you start talking about those firms that are above that $100,000 or above that million dollars, how do we get them there? And if saying that, hey, man, you know what? Having a master's degree is definitely going to increase your chances of becoming a million dollar firm. That's something that we have not been able to have the conversation with before, just like some of the questions that we're going to ask um, this afternoon, I hope. 
and like just as an academic, well, did you all have anything to add? And then I'll. I'll no, nothing. So, so just as an academic matter, you know, just kind of just frankly as an academic matter, right? Um, we had just over 150 respondents, right? So we really did this with Google survey, bare bones. We basically said, hey, you can are eligible to win some Chromebooks if you do this. You know, if we had some resources to invest in this, if we, for example, could give everybody a $10 Amazon gift card or whatever, right? And we could get the response rate up to like 500, 1,000, uh, then we would be able to split the data and come up with really very accurate, a very low, uh, so, so in other words, if you start splitting 150 people and you say, hey, you know, 15 people said this, et cetera, then that throws off your uh, kind of margin of error, right? When, you, when we have 150 people and we're talking about big general questions like this, it can be relatively accurate, but in terms of splitting, we just need, it's really a resource issue, and it's also more a, a larger respondent uh, question. And so as we go deeper, as, as Ron says, and if we have resources to go deeper in the future, we certainly will, and uh, you know, we'll, we'll get some deeper insights and be able to kind of slice and dice, right, particular uh, demographic uh, uh, pieces here. Uh, also wanted to acknowledge Karen Street, who's the policy director of the CBC, and we look forward to working with the CBC on a number of a future of work and uh, a future of uh, community of color, communities of color uh, issues uh, here. Any other comments or quick? Well, Ironically, yeah. I had a question. Okay, well that's good. Thank you for the introduction. Um, uh, this is um, on the just something that jumped out to me on the cybersecurity piece, um, and so from Karen's point of um, interested in any insight you all have, but but also interested in kind of hearing from the chamber leaders in terms of how you all, how you all are addressing this issue of cybersecurity and kind of raising it with your members. Um, it was interesting to me. I mean, first of all, I'm a terrible millennial, so I don't even understand um, you know what to expect with a cyber attack. But the loss of data as a result of cyber attacks, um, the the fact that 57% of Black business owners. Um, uh, had a resulting loss of data and only 29% of Latino businesses. So that disparity kind of jumped out at me. Um, but as we're looking at you know, the, the opportunity to, to increase um, the potential of these businesses, particularly in terms of data analytics and getting into that kind of next level of using that data to kind of drive your business growth, um, obviously as you, you know, to whom much is given, much is required. So as you get that data, um, you know, obviously there's, there's going to be more of an emphasis on how you're protecting that data. Um, obviously very important in this culture of kind of rapid response on social media. Um, so just interested to hear kind of about that disparity in the, the, the um, subject itself and, and how members are addressing it. And I just want to clarify for everybody, and you tell us if we're wrong, Ron, that it was of those who suffered cyber attacks, it, there was the disparity, right? So it wasn't a scenario where 57% had uh, black folks, for example, uh, had experienced cyber attacks. But please clarify that. Yeah, no, absolutely. And I think what's really interesting, what we all talk about is, you know, one in three businesses that, or 30% of businesses that have a cybersecurity attack, uh, one in three of them will close within the next year. And so it's, it's really dramatic, and I think it's interesting. We can't tell people to go online and not be safe online. And so it's really important that if you do have these outcomes, um, what are the tools to reconcile that? Uh, what can you do to you know, regain customer trust? What can you do to uh, make sure that that doesn't happen again? Um, and I think you know, what's really interesting is when we were looking at this, we were looking at this survey, one of the respondents said, you know, one of my customers or you know, one of the people I work with is Equifax. And so you know, they were talking about how, fear, how, how, how relevant that fear is and how immediate it can be yeah. is, is very much a part of a discourse about bringing people online, making sure they're educated. And I think the idea of digital literacy is mm -hmm. what we don't really have often when we're talking about. Yeah. And if I could just respond real quick on, on that note, it's actually, it's very timely. Over the last year, uh, two of our major members had massive security breaches in the last 12 months. And these are, I'm, I'm not talking the small mom and pop shop, which are also part of our, our membership uh, by way of our local chambers and also uh, our direct membership. But I'm talking, you know, multi-million dollars, hundreds of, 
hundreds upon hundreds of million of dollar million dollar companies that had these breaches and literally stopped operations for them for you know a pro you know anywhere from six six months and to now they're still you know coming back from it. So we are in that we are in that age where you know digital digital, digital literacy, but even beyond that, digital uh, being being cognizant and, and and working on digital protection is something that we're working in collaboration with some of our partners. So I think for us, it's an educational component. It's a matter of like making sure that you know we're pumping out our uh, uh, we're, we're we're leveraging our collaboration with our partners that have the resources to to put together programs like that. I'm talking like visas, like Google's, uh, like Verizon's, who kind of have the uh, broader resources to be able to implement different educational programs. Uh, and we're that's something that's actually on the docket for us in, in 2018, something that we've started to kind of ramp up in 2017. And I think one of the, the, the major components that we'll use as kind of a, a vessel for that in the coming year is uh, going to be uh, cited during our, actually our shared CTI chain training. We have something between the the four of uh, chambers that I had mentioned uh, earlier between the NGLCC, USBC, um, US Pan Asian American Chambers, and the US Hispanic Chamber of Commerce uh, called uh, Chamber Training Institute, where we do essentially bring in folks like Diane, like some of our, our local chambers of commerce, to educate them on different best practices, whether it be marketing, whether it be social media, whether it is cybersecurity. Uh, and then that way they're able to, you know, go out and push that back out to our members that are kind of at the, the greatest risk of some of those threats. I think it's really twofold. One is communication. Um, and I don't think we have that conversation enough in our communities. We just don't fear what we don't know until it's too late. Uh, in reference to education, one of our board members, Antoine Ford, uh, who is the president and CEO of Enlightened Services here in Washington, D.C., just granted Howard University a $250,000 check to create uh, the cybersecurity school uh, at Howard University. He would have taken that anywhere. Uh, he's not even a graduate of Howard. He went to George Washington. But he understood the importance of making sure that our members, our community, uh, has the education uh, and the platform to be able to address it today as well as in the future. Uh, one thing that I wanted to add is like in our situation with our small businesses, usually what I recommend them to do is to integrate an SSL certificate into their website, at least a 256 uh, uh, encrypted technology, um, just to be protected and also Google is benefiting, of, I'm sorry, um, adding more SEO use to all those websites that have that uh, encrypted certification. So it's good to have and it's very affordable even for a small business uh, to have on their site. And then for those that have like a lot of traffic, you know, and, 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 and they become automatically target for scammers, there are other options that they can implement into their sites to try to protect their environment. But I think it's highly recommended that we educate them about the importance of protecting their different uh, assets because it's one of the barriers that it's uh, stopping uh, small businesses from entering online from the privacy issues or the liabilities that it carries when you start taking uh, credit cards on your website. Yeah. In line with that, um, I was, I was um, intrigued by the, the website question and particularly sort of website versus app and particularly websites that are mobile app optimized, which means you don't necessarily need an app. So some of this is around expense. In terms of your assumptions as to why an app would be, why someone would have an app versus um, why they would they would just sort of go to a mobile optimized solution. Did you dig a, a, a little bit deeper in that space? Because I, my sense is that depending on the industry, it's going to depend on whether or not you need an app or not. Vis-a-vis, mm -hmm. um, -vis, you know, whether or not you're fine to sort of be, if you're more retail oriented, you might be much more app driven. Um, as opposed to sort of being service a service or company where you might be more mobile optimized. So was mm -hmm. there any any sense of what that was? Because you can have robustness in each. So I was just wondering what. Right, you guys I think we just those questions. Yeah, put, just put the questions there. But Ron, did you have any particular insights? I mean, yeah. I, I don't know the gap between those that have an app but don't have a website or have a website but don't have an app. And I, I think that might be interesting and I think there's there's room for that conversation. And I think what they've spoken about is the fact that there is more to come in this. This is sort of the first iteration of a larger discourse. 
but I think that we can pose that question to the, the information and, and get back insights as well. Right. And I mean, there are things that weren't published here that we asked, like who's used uh, online access to capital and mm -hmm. online lenders mm -hmm. uh, here, not banks, but you know, mm -hmm. the, the various services that provide access to capital. And so some other things that weren't necessarily published uh, here that we may go deeper into uh, moving forward. Yeah. Okay, so out of time, one last comment here, David? Uh, yeah, I guess real quick, I just went to a um, cybersecurity briefing last week, and um, that's not my area of expertise, um, but what I learned was that um, a lot of the entrepreneurs in there um, were saying that there's like a hard and a soft side of the cybersecurity breaches, and so the hard side is being that, you know, they want to make sure they have the right software and fail safes in place, but often a lot of times with these breaches is that it's an employee who essentially left door open. Mm -hmm. So in terms of solutions, I think it's important that we consider training and keeping our workforce um, aware of the best ways to keep the doors locked and keep the company sealed. Because um, the expert panelists and the entrepreneurs in the audience were very more more concerned with the people on their team potentially leaving the doors open than the, the software breaking down. Yeah. So, um, as, as we wrap up, I, I do want to make some acknowledgments in terms of uh, thanking some folks. You know, obviously, we really appreciate you all uh, coming and your time and your questions and your engagement. I uh, want to circle back and thank the uh, U.S. Black Chambers, the Hispanic Chamber of E-Commerce, and the U.S. Hispanic <coughs> Chamber of, of Commerce, uh, essential partners here. I uh, want to just acknowledge, uh, again, just because it's, you know, such good work in terms of Ron Busby, Jr. I thought you were about to say senior, man. I'm sorry. <laughs> 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 you did good to uh, so, uh, I'm feeling a little left out. Uh, well, I, I want to be like you in terms of uh, have my name say do some good stuff here. Or anything, I mean. And uh, Morgan uh, Butler and uh, Mia Woodard. Uh, thank you all uh, so much for this this report. Uh, Joint Center staff, if you could just kind of raise your hands. Thank you, including interns here. Thank you for your work. And finally, I've got to acknowledge uh, Utsi Bokiwa, uh, who put this event together and is our our big uh, leading uh, person with regard to uh, events management. So, uh, Utsi. See you all in terms of the next steps. Thank you all for being here. Can I have U.S. Black